Just. Just wanna praise you forever and ever and ever and ever for all you done for me. Let's sing it. 
the Lord. You are worthy to be praised. Thank you, Lord. Some of you don't know that the Lord spoke to me in the year 2001. I was on a flight to Chicago from Baltimore, Maryland. When I heard that voice, I now know as God speak to my heart saying, hurry up and move down to Palm Bay right away. <laughs> and I landed and I called my wife from Chicago and I said, honey, the Lord spoke to me on the plane, said we need to move. You know what she said? She said, let's get the house together. And then we shampooed the rug, cleaned out the house, put it on the market in Maryland, and it sold in 45 minutes to the first person that walked through the door. And I said, I mean, what else do I need to know? And you know, the Lord had already blessed us with some land here in Florida. Uh, I, I had, my wife always tells people that she didn't, she knew that the Lord didn't want her with me when I was looking where I was looking. Because she would have said to me, boy, you know, you have no business looking up in here. It's too expensive for us to go anywhere near there. But anybody know God is able? And I pulled into an open house sign, walked into this open house, met the, the people, and we got to talking, and I said, you know, uh, they said, what do you do? I said, well, most people know me from my music. He said, oh, can I show you my sound system? I said, I said, sure. He played me the best sounding sound system I'd ever heard. And I said, I'd give you one of my CDs, but I don't have one. But I always walk with my background tracks that I do concerts with, and I'd like to sing a song for you. The man said, sure. And he called his wife. They sat down. And I sang a song, the song I'm about to sing to you. And when I finished that song, both of them were in tears, and she said, you don't realize it, sir, but God sent you here today. And he said, I feel impressed to show you some property. Come go with me. And we've been living in that spot. for the last 22 years. Let us pray. Father, as we open your holy word, I ask that you would cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Fill my life with your Holy Spirit's presence and power. Speak to me, through me, and for me. I promise you, Lord, I'll always give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 4. The book of 1 Samuel. Chapter 1, verse 4. The Bible says, And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion. But the Lord had shut up her womb. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. 
My message this morning, the power of a praying woman. The power of a praying woman. You know, it has been my honor and humble privilege to meet in my life some of the most extraordinary women of our time. I first start with my wife. She is the most extraordinary woman I have ever met and I have ever known. And when we can talk privately, I'll tell you why. <laughs> She's a woman of faith, a virtuous woman from a child. I live with a woman I am in awe of. After her comes some amazing barrier-breaking women I hold in high esteem women who were leaders and fighters, courageous women, and some of them this generation may not even know their names. Names like Shirley Chisholm, a woman who embraced me woman who encouraged me. Women like Dr. Dorothy Height, who was there when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his speech. Her spiritual daughter, Alexis Herman, the first black woman secretary of, the, of labor for the United States of America. And yes, women like Oprah and C. Dolores Tucker, and this week, we lost one of those incredible women, a woman whose story of surviving domestic abuse has inspired a generation of women to fight for their freedom and self-respect. And for this, I have always admired Tina Turner. Tina Turner has been, for sure, one of the most inspiring women I have ever met. It was my honor to meet her on more than one occasion. Now, my wife, Linda, doesn't mind me telling you that meeting Tina Turner was one of the giddy highlights of my life. Even my children know what an amazing woman I thought she was. I, I remember in May 2011, 12 years ago, Linda and I took one of our sons to a celebrity event in Chicago, and all of the celebrities being introduced were kept as a surprise to those of us in the audience. You know, and, the, the, and they'd say, ladies and gentlemen, and now, Will Smith and Jada Pinkett, and everybody was shouting, you know, because we, we didn't know who was going to be introduced next. And then the, the announcer said, ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce to you Beyonce. And my young son stood up with much excitement and glee and said, wow, Beyonce. I said, son, sit down. You don't have to get so excited. It's just Beyonce, sit down. You know what that little boy said to me? D Daddy, Daddy, how can I explain this to you? He said, Beyonce is to me what Tina Turner was to you. <laughs> I said, okay, son, I got it. <laughs> and as I prepared this sermon, my mind went to another inspiring woman I have met on several occasions, Michelle Obama, yeah. a brilliant, successful woman in her own right. And as I prepared for this sermon, 
I found something out about Michelle Obama that I did not know. I did not know that after years of miscarriages, Michelle and Barack Obama didn't know if they would ever have children. And Michelle Obama said, I felt like I failed because I didn't know how common miscarriages were. Because you see, she said, we didn't talk about them. She said, we sit in our own pain thinking that somehow we're broken. So that's one of the reasons why I think it is important to talk to young mothers about the fact that miscarriages happen and the biological clock is real, she said. I realized, she said, that I was 34, 35, and we had to do IVF. And church, the former first lady, finally had her daughters, Malia and Sasha, through in vitro fertilization. Well, here in our scripture, the Bible tells us of another woman who faced a similar circumstance. Her name was Hannah. Her husband's name was Elkanah. The Bible tells us that they were not able to have a child together. And back then in Bible times, there was not available to women the options and choices we have today. In Bible times, there were no scientific ways to address medically issues of infertility. And in Bible times, a wife who was barren and unable to have children it was often seen as a sign of God's discipline or God's displeasure. And even though Elkanah loved Hannah, he still thought that the only way to honorably address their unfortunate circumstance was by contracting a second marriage with a woman who could bear him children. You know, a kind of Old Testament Bible times <laughs> younger wife surrogate. And so consistent with the times and culture, sadly, Elkanah arranged a second marriage with a younger, more well-endowed, fertile woman by the name of Penina. Now, you've heard me say it before from this pulpit, any man who can make one woman supremely happy is a genius. Come on. I'm an aspiring genius. But, but keeping two women supremely happy and those two women living in the same house or even in the same city, keeping those two women supremely happy requires a level of genius I have never seen in a man. Two relationships with two different women who know each other and living in the same house. That's a prescription for major trouble. You know, it's hard enough to keep the feelings and emotions of one relationship going in the right direction and keep that relationship consistently steady, come on, and on a happy plane <laughs> and positive. Accomplishing that sometimes is not easy. And anybody who tells you it is easy, trust me, they've never been married. <laughs> Think about this. Not even the angels in heaven were able to live together in peace. So what makes you think that two earth angels are not going to have rocky days and difficult moments? Some years ago, I was in a cab in Washington, D.C., and the cab driver and I struck up a conversation. I shared with him that I had been married at the time for 37 years. He said, man, how did you do it? And then he said, I've been married 
for 25 years. And he said, for me, marriage is managing despair. So sad. And I'm sure that describes how Hannah was feeling with another woman in the picture. Hannah was managing despair. Many of you know, even in a relationship that is going well, how hard it can be for both parties in the marriage to always, not sometimes, always be pleasant. Not sometimes. Always be congenial. Y'all be quiet like you don't know. <laughs> Always cheerful. Always good natured. Some think to try to live like that is unrealistic. Well, I learned early in my marriage, I made myself a promise that I was never going to raise my voice in hostility or anger in, to my wife throughout our entire marriage and by the grace of God I think she'll tell you I have never in 47 years raised my voice in our marriage in anger to my wife by God's grace I've never done it and never will it's not just cause it's not, you know, my, it's my nature. No, no, no. It's a decision. <laughs> now, according to Hebrew records, Penina, this younger, more fertile wife, had not one or two children. The Bible says Penina gave birth to ten sons, two daughters, all from Elkanah. Elkanah was busy. <laughs> and poor Hannah all those years still had no child that meant more trouble in the house here's what the Bible says that Elkanah did trying to handle this situation he wanted to make things better but he made it worse Samuel the book of Samuel says when the time came that Elkanah offered sacrifices and gave gifts to his wives. Remember our text? Elkanah gave to Penina his second wife and to all her ten sons and daughters generous portions and gifts. But look at what the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 5. But unto Hannah who bore him no children Elkanah gave, the Bible says, a worthy portion. Now some translations say a double portion. 1 Samuel 1 5. But under Hannah he gave a worthy portion. Why? <laughs> oh Lord, trouble. He's, this brother got trouble. I gave you 10 sons, 12 children. She gave you none. Then you give her in gifts double what you gave me, all because you love her. No, 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 no. This will be addressed. <laughs> Hear me today. If you want to start trouble in your house, brothers, I know exactly what you need to do. Just give another woman twice as much of anything as you give your wife, and I guarantee you, you will have trouble. I don't care if it's a female cousin, a female female friend, a sister, a mother, a grandmother. I don't care if you're giving her Bible studies. You hear me? If you give her twice as much as your, of your time, of your money, of your s smiles, your words of encouragement, if you give any woman twice as much of anything, then you give your wife, you will have World War Three on your hands it's only human nature. No wife is going to put up with that. Come on, wives. <laughs> As a matter of fact, let me tell you something. Giving any one preferential treatment over your wife 
is not only a sign of disrespect, it is profane and ungodly. And it is a mistake. If you're doing it, you need to correct it immediately. You know, think, think about it. On Mother's Day, Mother's Day just went by. Penina receives a dozen roses, and on that same day, some woman across town named Hannah gets two dozen roses. Penina gets a gift card for a thousand dollars for her birthday. For some, some woman across town named Hannah gets a gift card for two thousand dollars on her birthday. You got trouble. You can understand how Penina would see herself in a battle for Elkanah's heart and affections. Penina knew Elkanah wasn't giving Hannah twice as much of everything because he felt sorry for her. No, because he loved her. Now, how can I explain this? <laughs> you see, when Elkanah would leave Hannah's tent in the morning to come back to Penina's tent, Penina couldn't help but think to herself, why is this brother smiling so much? He's just smiling way too much. And believe me, a woman always knows. Why? Because men can't hide it well. Oh, oh, oh yeah, and forget this. Oh, but we're just like brother and sister. Forget that stuff. I got a bridge in Brooklyn I want to sell you. I've seen so many men get in trouble whenever they start feeling sorry for any woman who is not his wife. And some brothers don't have a clue about what's really going on. Penina couldn't help but notice that special sparkle in Elkanah's eyes whenever he spoke Hannah's name. She could hear the tender tone in his voice when he would start talking about his upcoming visits to Hannah that he had scheduled. And You know, come on, ladies. Come, ladies, you with me, right? You with me? Elkanah, when asked about going to see Hannah, had the nerve to open his mouth and say, oh, how he was really looking forward to visiting Hannah. And, and, and Wrong answer, brother. I'll never forget the time we were walking up the stairs at a friend's home and coming down, Linda and I were walking up the stairs, coming down was Halle Berry. And we smiled, had said hello, talk, walk past. Linda looks at me, oh, isn't she beautiful? I said, she all right. <laughs> I am not going to get tricked. You think I'm going to get tricked in that? <laughs> and I wanted to say, Elkanah, keep your mouth shut, brother. You know, when I call my wife Linda's name, it is with awe and reverence. If you haven't heard it, it is with awe and reverence. I can't imagine what it would be like for an insecure second wife to hear me talking about Linda. But what could, what could Penina do? Hannah was the one who walked with Elkanah in the springtime of his years. Hannah was the one who prayed him through the hard times and the hungry years. Hannah was the one who wiped away his fears before that second woman came along. Come on, help me somebody. She was the one who, with a look and a cheering word, would calm Elkanah's anxious, troubled spirit. Penina knew that Hannah was Elkanah's first love, his childhood sweetheart. And in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 6, the Bible calls Hannah Penina's adversary. Look at it. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 6. And her adversary also did what? Provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had done what? Shut up her wound. Church, when the Bible calls Penina Hannah's adversary, the Bible is saying Penina was Hannah's rival, her opponent, her challenger. And how sad. Well, Elkanah wasn't looking. When Elkanah wasn't looking, Penina would say the most cruel things to provoke Hannah. 
Panana would smile in Elkanah's face. You know, some women can do that, boy. They'll smile and, you know, but under their breath, Now, ladies, you know I'm telling the truth. You know, one thing my wife taught me about women, she, she taught me that a woman would walk into her room, turn around and walk out, all the men would say hi, hello there. But the women who were looking at the woman who walked in the room, they could tell you how much she weighed, <laughs> what she got on. Come on, somebody. They, I didn't make this up. My wife told me. She taught me this. <laughs> and Penina would smile in Elkanah's face and under her breath she'd say things to Hannah like, So Hannah, if you're so holy, how come your womb is all closed up? Come on. If you're so spiritual, how come God hasn't given you a child? I got 12. Hannah, uh, when is that little boy coming anyway? Oh, 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 you're working on it, are you? Church, I don't care how smooth a brother is. Two wives is a prescription for trouble, even if both of the women are saints. Now notice, look at 1 Samuel 1, verse 6 again. It says, and her adversary also, what? Provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. So the Bible says that it was God who shut up her womb. Sometimes we don't understand why everybody else, it seems, is able to get what we can't get. But what we don't often see is what God has for you is for you and you'll get what God has for you in God's own time. And believe me, if you really knew what other people are going through, if you really knew what other people are dealing with in their lives, you wouldn't want their lives. You wouldn't want their jobs or their titles. You wouldn't want their bills. You wouldn't want their debts. So right now, I think somebody ought to just thank God for the life you got. Hallelujah. You need to take a moment, a praise moment, and praise God for what you have. Thank him that you don't have somebody else's taxes, somebody else's stress. Yeah, you want that Ted bedroom house, you want that taxes too? You ought to take this moment, thank God for your humble home. I said, thank God for your humble home. You ought to thank God and be grateful for the life you have. And remember, if you don't have all you want, remember this, it could be worse. Ah! And remember, remember, God knows what's best. Believe me, if you look carefully, you'll see. God is giving you grace for your trials. He's giving you blessings for your burdens. Blessings for your burdens. And yes, Hannah knew it was God who shut up her womb, and that also meant to Hannah, if God closed it, he can open it. Somebody say hallelujah. The old folks used to say, Lord, I know you can if you will. Well, one day Hannah did what all godly women do when you can't take it anymore. She went to the church to pray. And my message today, the power of a praying woman. Amen. Hannah got on her knees, took her troubles to the Lord in prayer. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible tells us one day after the family had eaten, Hannah went to the sanctuary to pray and Eli, the high priest, was sitting by the entrance to minister to the needs of the people. Hannah stood not far from where Eli was seated. She silently cried and prayed. And women, have you ever cried and prayed?
prayed to the Lord. She silently prayed and she was telling the Lord about what Penina was doing and how it was getting to be too much for her to bear. And then Hannah said a prayer. The Bible says it this way. I love Hannah's prayer. Listen to what she says. First Samuel chapter 1 verse 11. The Bible says she made a vow to the Lord. And this is her prayer. Almighty Lord, please look down on my misery and help me. Please open my womb and let me bear a son. If you do, I'll give him to you. And he will be yours forever. I promise to carefully raise him and not to cut his hair as a sign that he belongs to you. And as she was praying, Eli the high priest said, saw Hannah and, and he noticed her lips moving and no sound coming out and he decided that Hannah had to have been drinking, drunk, and he scolded her. Look at it, 1 Samuel 1, verse 14. He said, how long are you going to stay here and attract attention to yourself? You'd better go home and sleep off your wine and stop drinking. Hannah got up off her knees and said, Eli, sir, I'm not drunk. I'm a praying woman. I'm a woman on my knees. I've not touched one drop of wine. I'm praying my heart out to God. I'm pouring out my troubles to God. Been telling him all about my situation. Eli said to her, sir, I'm sorry. She said, he said, Eli said to her, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, my sister. I misread the situation. And then he said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant you the power of a praying woman. May God grant you your petition that thou hast asked of him. And the Lord, may the Lord, I love this, may the Lord, the God of Israel, answer your prayer and give you whatever you ask for. Hannah took Eli at his word. She believed she believed that the Lord had spoken through Eli. She believed that God would answer her prayer. And that night, Hannah went home smiling. Somebody say amen. amen. She was smiling through her tears, her face beaming with gratitude and thanksgiving. And just, just like that, Hannah's pain was gone. Hannah's sorrow was gone. The, the power of a praying woman. Just like that, God lifted the burden off of her spirit. Hannah felt like a new woman. And then the Bible says early the next morning, 1 Samuel 1, 19, early the next morning, the family worshipped the Lord, went back home to Ramah. And for the first time in a long time, Hannah's face was not downcast. She looked, come on, she looked prettier than she had ever looked in quite a while. Elkanah saw Hannah's cheery mood and he couldn't wait to get home to Hannah. <laughs> he saw Hannah smiling, looking good. Elkanah knew that when, when, your, when your wife is happy, life is good. <laughs> when your wife is happy, it's going to be a blessed night. Y'all don't know what, y'all not listening to me. I'm just preaching what's in the Bible. Look at it, 1 Samuel 1, 19. The Bible says, and they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord. Now remember, the Bible says, in thy presence is fullness of joy. So they rose up in the morning early, worshiped before the Lord, returned, came to their house to Ramah, and Elkanah knew, look at, uh, I love the Bible, the, the Bible just kind of throws it in, you got to read between the lines, help me somebody, and Elkanah what? New Hannah, that's all it said, but you have to read between the lines, what that is, come on, help me somebody, Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her, and look at verse 20. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about that Hannah had conceived. That didn't happen from a Bible study. Y'all listening to me today. Hannah what? 
conceived and she bare a son and called his name Samuel saying because I have asked him of the Lord. Don't you ever underestimate the power of a praying woman. Don't you ever underestimate the power of a praying woman. The Bible says the Lord remembered Hannah, answered her prayer. She conceived, gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, meaning asked of God. And in due course, the Bible says she took Samuel to Eli. And Hannah said to, to him, Sir, I'm the woman you prayed for a few years ago. And you told me that the Lord would answer my prayer. And I want you to know God answered my prayer and I have come to present before the Lord the son God has given to me. I've come to the temple today because I promised the Lord that if he would answer my prayer and give me a child, I would give him back to the Lord to serve him. And then Hannah prayed one of the most amazing prayers ever prayed. Look at it. She said, my heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. And then she said, There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. And then she said, my heart is full of joy in the Lord. The power of a praying woman. My strength and happiness comes from him. I can laugh again because God has given me a child. Hallelujah, God. He has silenced my enemies. In verse 2, that no one is holy like the Lord, there's no other God. Church, what a prayer of thanksgiving. Did you know Hannah went on to give Elkanah three sons, three more sons, and two daughters. In his book, My Utmost for His Highest, Oswald Chambers wrote, If through a broken heart, God can bring his purposes to pass in the world, then thank him for breaking your heart. If through a broken heart, God can bring his purposes to pass, in your life. Thank him. For breaking your heart. Thank him as the poet Harold F. Warren once wrote. He gives me strength and courage. When failure comes my way. He's my inspiration to face. Each newborn day. He comforts and sustains me. When my efforts seem in vain. He is my consolation in times of grief and pain. He is my friend when others refuse to lend an ear. In my hours of loneliness, I know that he is near. He never will forsake me, imperfect though I be. For with my many faults and sins, I know he still loves me. Lord have mercy. I want to skip down because I, I don't have enough time to finish this sermon. But today, like Hannah, look at Philippians 4, verse 6. Pour out your heart before him today, some woman. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing. Woman of God, 
in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your, I'm talking to some woman today, some woman today, let your requests be known, made known unto God and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And when you come before him, woman of God, women of God, believe in the power of a praying woman. Come like a beggar who is confident she has the air of the king. Pray like the answer to your prayer will be for the glory of God. Pray like your prayer will move the arm of omnipotence. Bring him your prayers. Bring him your sorrows. Thank you, Father. Bring him your cares. Bring him your faults. You got a few of those, don't you? Bring him your failings. As I close today, I want to tell you about a praying woman. My message, the power of a praying woman. I want to tell you about a praying woman named Osceola. Osceola came into the world after her mother was raped on a wooded path in rural Mississippi. The power of a praying woman. Osceola was raised in Hattiesburg by her grandmother and her aunt. Together, her grandmother and aunt cleaned houses, cooked, and the old folks, you know what I'm talking about, took in laundry. And as a little girl, Osceola would come home from elementary school. Osceola, at eight years of age, would iron clothes. Eight-year-old girl. The little money Osceola earned, she put it away in her doll buggy. Remember those? One day, her aunt came home from the hospital, unable to walk. Osceola dropped out of the sixth grade to care for her aunt and take over her work as a washerwoman. And since that time, Osceola never returned to school. She said, I knew there were people who didn't have to work as hard as I did, but it didn't make me feel sad, she said. I love to work. And when you love to do anything, those things don't bother you. She says, sometimes I work straight through two or three days. As a little girl, I, I had goals I was working towards. Church, Osceola was a praying woman. She said, I would start every day on my knees saying the Lord's Prayer. And then she said, then I get busy about my work. I want you to know for decades, Osceola scrubbed laundry by hand on a rub board. Y'all don't know what, uh, about that. She said her method of boiling clothes, my wife's mother used to boil clothes in a cast iron pot. And then, and then she, Osceola said, after boiling clothes in a pot, four fresh water rinses, then drying the clothes on a hundred feet of open air clothesline. She said the washers and dryers of the 60s weren't good enough to meet her standards. And so every day, this five foot, 100 pound praying woman, she said I'd wash all day and in the evening I'd iron until 11 at night. I love the work, she said, wrenching the wet clean cloth and White shirts shining on the line. Osceola was baptized at 
the age of 13, she walked almost everywhere, more than a mile just to get groceries. I tell, I'm talking to you about the power of a praying woman. She washed every day until she retired at the age of 86. Now I want you to know that since she was eight years old, Osceola started going to the bank and depositing the little money she earned. She said, I didn't tell mama and them I was going. I never would take any money out, she said. I just put it in. She said, you know, it's, it's not the ones that make the big money, but the ones who know how to save who get ahead. Well, the power of a praying woman. When Osceola retired in 1995 at the age of 86 with her hands painfully swollen with arthritis, this washerwoman who had been paid in coins and dollar bills her entire life was told by the officials at the bank that the money in her bank account was almost $300,000. That's a lot of money. But even more incredible, Osceola called up the University of Southern Mississippi to tell them that she wanted to give most of that money away, $150,000 to help worthy and needy, needy black students so they could have the education she was not able to have. You can't tell me about the power of a praying woman. When the community heard about her gift, not only did they give enough to more than triple Osceola's gift, millions of dollars poured in, inspired by Osceola McCarthy's gift. When Ted Turner from CNN heard about Osceola's gift, he decided to donate a billion dollars to charity, he said, if that little woman can give away everything she has, then surely I can give a billion. The power of a praying woman. Even today, the university still presents several full tuition scholarships in her name. Osceola went on to receive an honorary doctorate from Harvard University. She received the Presidential Citizens Medal from President Bill Clinton, the nation's second highest civilian award. And I have it on good authority. I was told by somebody who was there that President Clinton had her as his evening guest to the Black Caucus dinner he put her up in the swanky Willard Hotel. And Osceola wouldn't order room service because she said, they said, why, you were hungry? She said, yeah, I was hungry, but $22 for a hamburger? She said, <laughs> And when asked why she gave most of her money away, she said, I live where I want to live. I live the way I want to live. I couldn't drive a car if I had one. And I'm too old to go to college, so I want to share my wealth with the children. Maybe I can make it so the children don't have to work like I did. And then she said, I'm proud that I'm leaving something positive in this world. My only regret is that I didn't have more to give. And before she died, Osceola said, I can't do everything, but I can do something to help somebody. And what I can do, I will do. 
power of a praying woman. Hey, I want you to see this woman that has inspired me, Osceola. Look up on the screen. Woman who started every day on her knees while saying the Lord's Prayer. That's Osceola with her Bible. The power of a praying woman. There's the washing on the line with her Bible. And there she is getting her honorary doctorate from Harvard University. Power of a praying woman. Will you pray with me? Are there any women here today under the sound of my voice? You need God to answer your prayers like Hannah. You want to ask God today to be a blessing to your children? To save your children? Deliver your children? Are there any women here today who in prayer want to place their children in the hands of a loving God? Children who live under the shadow of the Almighty through the faith of praying women, I believe the Lord will give to the praying woman the wisdom and the grace she needs. Church, I believe in the power of praying women. When I was conceived out of wedlock, it was two grandmothers who came together and prayed for me. And the prayer they decided to pray was, Lord, make this child's life a blessing to the world. And when I look at my life, how God answered the prayers of a praying mother and the prayers of two praying grandmothers, I can't help it. I believe in the power of praying women. My sister, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you are a woman who wants to bring a child, a grandchild, and present them to Jesus today, if you are a praying woman, you have a situation or a circumstance you need to bring before the Lord. I invite you to stand on your feet right now. Stand on your feet and come here to this altar for a word of prayer. If you are a praying woman who wants to call on God for a miracle today, I invite you to slip out of the aisle. Come to this altar for a word of prayer. I believe in the power of a praying woman. Let me tell you something. I am what I am. I am who I am today. Because no woman has prayed more for me than my wife, Linda. Every concert, she's there praying for me. Every song I sing, 
when I think I'm going to falter or my vocal cords are going to give way. I know there's a lady in the corner. There's a woman in her seat praying for me. When I stand before millions of people not knowing how I'm going to do it, I'm going to make out. Not knowing whether I'm going to stumble. You think it's because of talent or skill. There's a woman praying for me. And I believe in the power of a praying woman. So those of you who are here today, beautiful, gifted, talented women, coming like Hannah before the Lord, bringing your challenges, circumstances, bringing your sorrows, bringing your trials. I'm going to say to you like Eli said to Hannah, go in peace. Your prayers have been answered. Go in peace. Your prayers have been answered. And don't you ever underestimate the power of a praying woman. Father, I thank you for those women who've come forward, those who've stood, bringing you their children, their grandchildren, their sorrows, their trials, their difficulties, their burdens. May they hear you whispering in their ear, go in peace. Your prayers have been answered. May they leave encouraged, buoyed, Filled with your spirit. This is my prayer for every woman who stood, who has come forward today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Somebody as I pass. Alone, if I can have somebody with a word of song, if I can show somebody. Then my living shall not be in vain. Then my living shall not be in vain.
for such a wonderful message. Let us stand as we do a benediction. The Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your love towards us. We want to thank you for your manservant. We want to thank you for our mothers, our daughters. Father, I pray that you would continue to use them so that they can show us how we are to live. We ask now that as we leave to go to our homes, that you would go before us and help us to always trust you. We thank you. We praise you. And Jesus, as they pray, please save us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Praise Him, praise Him.
praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Our blessed Redeemer, heavenly waters, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king. 